Hi, everyone. Welcome to week six. I want to start by saying papers look great. I've only had a chance to very briefly skim through what's been posted, but I like what I see so far. I'm looking forward to reading in further detail to really digging into what everyone wrote. And you'll see that there's a little bit of a follow-up assignment for that. So I'm really interested to see what you post for that as well. So thanks everyone for posting. If you have any lingering questions or concerns about the paper, please let me know as soon as possible. It's an important first milestone. Pat yourself on the back if you've completed it and more on that in the coming week after I've had a chance to go through and grade it. The theme for, for this week is form and psychology. And it's a sort of broad theme that goes back to the couple of very different readings that we had for this week. There's really not much of a connection between those two as there was between you know, the Bauhaus writers or the constructivists and so on. They're very loosely related. And so we have a very sort of broad theme for this week. I wanted to start addressing this theme by going back to some, some concepts and some works related to last week's topic. I ended by talking about Herbert Bayer, an important figure who emerged from the Bauhaus and then went on to have a long career following his time there. This is actually a work that was created after Bayer's time at the Bauhaus. I think it's a good example, very different from what we looked at last week, but a good example of what Walter Gropius was talking about when he said, said that the role of art, the role of the creative process is to give form to space. Again, this is an, an impossible idea that existed in Herbert Beyer's mind. He recognized some technical capabilities for making it a reality, meaning he understood enough about photo manipulation and altering pictures in the dark room, and then created this image uh, which takes a form for the thing that occupied a space in his mind. So I think it's a really interesting approach to Walter Gropius's ideas, and it starts to illustrate to us how someone like Herbert Beyer would expand from those thoughts, created into new forms of making, which is exactly what he did. I wanna talk about another Herbert Beyer project, which is controversial in some ways, and I think important to note. Beyer stuck around Germany for a while after the Bauhaus was disbanded. He had actually left the Bauhaus in 1928 when he took a job in the Berlin office of Vogue magazine. He stuck around Germany until 1937 when his work was cast in a, in a show of degenerate art and he recognized that the situation was becoming a little problematic or dangerous for him so then he fled to Italy and the US. But before doing that he took on a commission to create this brochure uh, that accompanied a, a big sort of festival in Germany and this brochure was called the Deutschland Ausstellung. Um, it, it's, it's basically a, a, a German uh, guide and the whole point of this brochure was to talk about aspects of German life and culture. So, and he used these kind of innovative Bauhaus photo montage techniques to create scenes of fishing on, on the seaside, um, to show the mountains and uh, the mountain, mountain climbing experiences in a, in a sort of fractured photo montage typo photo kind of approach. You see, there's also this interesting strategy of having a book within a book throughout. So we have these photo montages on the sides, and then we have this little sort of brochure with the text in the center. Now there's a lot of content here about German culture. We're also seeing about German industry. And it's mostly just a sort of neutral tone. Uh, it's a visitor brochure for why one should come and see the country. However, we should recognize that there were some major cultural <laughs> changes, which I just alluded to, and which problematized Bayer's work on this project. Um, of course, in 1936, the ascendant political power was the Nazi party. Uh, it was a populist movement who 
claimed to be acting on behalf of the people of, of Germany. So we see these scenes of all types of German workers, um, the German people in a very sort of egalitarian type way, but we see that this is also backed by the uh, racist anti-Semitic undertones of the Nazi party. So it was really problematic to begin with. Fire came under fire following this and, and some people would argue for the cancellation of Bayer because of brochures like this one. And it is problematic. I think it raises very serious ethical questions for a designer. At what point do you stop taking the commission? At what point do you walk away? At what point should you remove yourself from a situation if the design does not align with your values? And to be fair, Bayer's values did not align with the Nazi party, but his life in Germany was comfortable up to a certain point, so he allowed it. So I think it's interesting to look at this and, and, and think about some of the ethical questions involved. And in fairness to Herbert Bayer, he came to the United States again in 1937, 38, and immediately began establishing the successful career in advertising that he would have in the U.S. until his death in 1985, I believe, if I've got the date correctly. Correct. He also began, uh, continued making his own art and photography and paintings, uh, started architectural projects, and took commissions for all sorts of different advertisements. Many of them were from the US government as well. So uh, this is an image that Bayer created for the Rural Electrification Administration. And it's a message uh, stating that the US troops and the, U the US's allies in, in World War II um, needed agricultural supplies like eggs. So he very quickly started creating images uh, you know, for the other side, as it were, or for this side, if you're watching this in the US. Um, and, and again, made uh, several of these propaganda type posters. Um, this one's talking about sort of uh, ending our reliance on, on certain Japanese technologies during World War II when we were fighting against Japan. So. You can see some of the ways that Herbert Bayer was maybe a little too forgiving of who he was advertising for, um, but also changed course after he, he saw that he, he may have been on the wrong side of history. So I think it's an interesting case study in how a designer can work. And Herbert Bayer is absolutely one of the giants in uh, 20th century advertising. But we encountered his work through the universal alphabet or the universal type system, which is what he was writing about and which is another important project that was in some ways career defining for him. Remember that he designed this typeface in 1925 when he was at the Bauhaus. Well, he continued to work on it for, for decades to follow and he fully developed a phonetic alphabet like this one, but for the English language, the idea being to get rid of certain letters that would be redundant. For example, you don't necessarily need a C and a K. You can find other uses. Uh, you, can, you can get rid of the C and just use S's and K's instead. So that was part of the phonetic system, which Herbert Bayer devised in 1959. So this was a continuing concern for many years in his life and career. And again, we should think about the functionality of this alphabet. We should think about its actual practicality. Can we really use this? Is this something that we would actually use universally for everything that we print? And if not, why not? What are the problems with doing that? I think there are a few and I think we should recognize what they might be. This project is also a nice lead in, I think, for this week's reading, and we could compare it for at least one of this week's readings, and we could compare it to something like Gil Sands, right? Gil Sands is often referred to as British Helvetica. Um, it, was a, it was created by a British foundry slightly after uh, the time that Herbert Beyer was originally conceiving of his kind of utopic alphabet. 
but it's very well in line with some of the other uh, sans serif modern typefaces that we see emerging in the early decades of the 20th century. It's a simple, elegant, no frills, sans serif typeface. It was designed by Eric Gill, thus the name, under, the guidance, under guidance from Stanley Morrison and also Beatrice Ward, who wrote the essay we read and who both worked for the Monotype Corporation. Ward was a publicist for the Monotype Corporation and she supervised the rollout of Gil Sands to the public. It, it, it immediately assumed the whole range of uses. Uh, it eventually was adopted for the, the Brandon and Penguin uh, paperbacks. Uh, the entire uh, British rail system used the typeface. And in some ways it's maybe similar to the universal typeface. It, it, it helps that we have this black, white, and red design when we, when we see the typeface. Maybe it sort of uh, you know, conjures connections in our mind. But at a glance, it's very similar. I'd like to suggest that upon further investigation, it's quite different. And we should think about how is it different? What makes this such a, and in some ways I think they're almost kind of antithetical to one another. How are these typefaces so similar, but so different? I think part of that can be explained by Beatrice Ward's essay. Remember she calls it the crystal goblet or why type should be invisible, or sorry, why printing should be invisible. I would argue that Herbert Byers' typeface is not at all invisible, that it actually calls your attention to it. You probably noticed as you were reading uh, the Herbert Byer essay, you've got to think back a little bit now, but you may recall that it was all in lowercase and that probably caught your attention. You were probably a little distracted from the content of the essay, wondering why it was all lowercase or wondering why he was playing with something like square span to present the type in a different sort of way. And in that sense, he's calling your attention to the type, which is exactly the opposite of what Beatrice Ward is arguing for in the Crystal Goblet. She's saying that you should never recognize the type. You should never dwell on what the type looks like in your printed materials. That means it's bad typography and it's distracting the reader, right? So there's a problem here. <laughs> we could also think about Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics, I think, as another tool for unpacking the differences here. And there's a couple notions about language that, that Saussure mentions in the text, which I think are very helpful in our understanding or, or our interpretation of, of these typefaces. The first thing that I'm thinking about is Saussure's idea that the written word is simply a way of transferring language, that language is something that happens between speakers where printing typography is just a, a way to sort of record that language. I think Herbert Beyer was aware of that, but I think he also worked in a way that was interfering with the language by calling people's attention to the the typography, it actually made it more difficult to, to read the language. Whereas somebody like Beatrice Ward, she uses this term, uh, a conveyor. She says that typography and printing should be a conveyor for ideas. They're not the idea in themselves. And the typographer must exercise a good degree of humility. They shouldn't insert themselves in the type. They shouldn't they shouldn't be present at all. They should try to make sure that their typography disappears into the background and that the words on the page are nothing more than a conveyor for ideas. I think this is very different from, from Herbert Byers' approach. We could also think about mutability and immutability in language. And maybe that's a part of the spoken language that also transfers to the typographic. Byers trying to 
create some sort of mutability in typography that wasn't quite there. He's trying to change it artificially. And the fact is there's all sorts of conventions and norms and conditioning behind the way that we read something. And the way that we read can be immutable, right? It's something that doesn't change that no one typographer can change. And that's probably what Herbert Beyer encountered. And that's probably why we don't read everything in the universal typeface today. At least that's one of the reasons. Anyhow, Beatrice Ward was a extremely uh, influential figure, even though her name wasn't necessarily directly on the designs. As a publicist for the Monotype Corporation, she essentially wrote the manifestos for, for what, this, uh, what this foundry's work should look like. And it did help to usher in a new way, a, a new age of, of modern typography. This is a, another example of her work. This is a, a design that she created. Um, it says, this is a printing office, crossroads of civilization, refuge of all the arts against the ravages of time, armory of fearless truth against whispering rumor, incessant trumpet of trade. From this place, words may fly abroad, not to perish on waves of sound, not to vary with the writer's hand, but fixed in time, having been verified by proof. Friend, you stand on sacred ground. This is a printing office. So powerful words presented in something of an understated kind of way. Again, the, the designer, the typographer, the printer should humble themselves. It's actually close to what Herbert Beyer was saying when he said uh, it's a service art, um, but Beatrice Ward is really embracing that to agree that I don't think Herbert Beyer ever really did. It's also important to note that, you know, when you think about that wine glass anal analogy, if somebody gave you this like sort of funky, weird shaped glass, even if it was still crystal clear, it would probably distract you, right? So there's different ways that that can take place. And I think that analogy goes very far. I hope it was clear in the reading what that sort of crystal goblet analogy was. I think it's also really interesting. She ends on an entirely different analogy about typography as a window. And I think that that one is equally powerful. Remember the idea is that there's essentially three types of windows, right? You could have a stained glass window that you can't see out of at all. Meaning that your typography could obscure the words that you're trying to read. It can distract the reader, right? You could also have a big wide open window and you see everything outside and, and, and that's great, but it's maybe not always possible. Maybe it sort of goes against the architecture if we sort of stick with a house analogy, or maybe it sort of lacks a certain kind of elegance in the overall structure. So fine printing, according to Beatrice Gross, should be like small leaded panes. You imagine an old building where it's a window and it's sort of divided up into very small panes of glass that you can still see out of, but you're always aware that you're looking out of a window. That to Beatrice Ward is the ideal type of typography. That's what she thinks the fine typographer, the fine printer should be striving for. And it's a very moderated, it's a very uh, moderate, it's a, it's a very humbling for, for lack of a better word, I'll let, I'll let the humility of the writer speak for itself. But that's the approach that Beatrice Ward takes. And I think it's a powerful one that designers often lose sight of. Anyhow, again, we see how there's a psychological effect for when you read something, right? The way you, you register something, the way that you can take in typography without being conscience, conscious of it. And again, the idea is form and psychology. There's another meaning for this, and this turns towards the, the uh, Yori Ke Kepish reading. Sorry, is it Yori Kepish? It's a tough one to pronounce. And it returns more directly to this theme, which can also, if you wanna say form, whole forms, and think about the psychological aspect of whole forms in design, there's a German word for it. I love these German words. And that German word is gestalt. 
Now, I've learned a lesson teaching this class that whenever I say Gestalt, the first thing that pops into your mind is the five principles of Gestalt, and then you can't think of anything outside of that. And that's why I avoided it, because I wanted you to take these readings in without any kind of preconceptions. But yes, we should know, we've all heard about the, uh, the preliminary, the basic principles of Gestalt, right? The five, the five main principles they originate in the, again in the early 20th century. The first philosophers and psychologists who determined a real theory of Gestalt psychology were, were three Germans named Max Wertheimer, Wolfgang Kohler, and Kurt Kafka. And again, these principles we see closure that your mind uh, seals the gap between these spaces on the G the idea of proximity that we put together the shape of an E or any other shape by, uh, by noticing the proximity of shapes next to one another. Continuation, meaning although we actually have three separate shapes overlapping parts of the S, our mind puts it back together and reads it as one long line. The principle of figure and ground, meaning that the A gives way to an arrow and we see both of those things in an interrelated uh, uh, coexistence with one another. And then the idea of similarity, that we, we put together two things because they form an equivalence, because we recognize their relationship based on the fact that they're similar to one another. This diagram is a little confusing because the T is also formed through the idea of closure but that's another story. The, the fact that there's two of them and our mind relates them to one another is, a, is an illustration of similarity. You've probably heard some of this. You probably have some sense of what Gestalt means and what it does. I want to get deeper into it and, and go back to how it, it relates to Yuri Ke Kepish reading. And to do that, I'm going to go way back and, and relate this to the history of German philosophy that informed these psychologists in the early 20th century. And this goes all the way back to Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Goethe was a late 18th century, early 19th century German romantic. He wrote poetry. He wrote an entire theory of color. And he also conducted all sorts of uh, kind of experiments, many of them on himself to understand the physics of light and color. Through those experiments, he devised uh, a very early version of a color wheel. And th this actually is very important in terms of uh, a scientific understanding of color. If you're reading German, and I know there's a lot of German words lately, but I don't expect you to read it. Um, you'll see that the outer ring says the names of the colors. And then the inner ring says some of the qualities that are associated with those colors. Goethe believed that there were intrinsic qualities that yellow was inherently good and would represent goodness, right? And then this sort of pinkish red area on the color wheel was beauty. And that somehow that was unequivocally related to beauty. This was his part of his theory of colors. Goethe also conducted all sorts of experiments, usually on himself, doing things like pressing hard on his eyeball for 30 seconds and then releasing it and looking at the sort of forms that appeared before his eyes. And this is part of a sort of broader set of, of perception experiments. Part of his point in conducting these experiments was to understand ways that the human mind constructed colors, shapes, and forms. His, his notion was that these can't be entirely of the outside world, or else when you press on your eye for 30 seconds, you wouldn't see anything afterwards. He recognized that we are constructing forms in our, in our eyes and in our mind when we look at the world around us. And to a certain extent, he was absolutely right. Your mind plays a major role in constructing an image of the world. Now, he also extended this towards uh, the spectrum and was looking for ways to, to, uh, to explain how a color spectrum works. 
And if you've seen the way that light is refracted through a prism, you'll understand that this is completely wrong. Uh, Goethe's idea was that uh, colors are completely constructed in the mind. And this happens uh, simply because of the human mind's inventiveness. It's a lovely idea, but it's wrong. Goethe went through great, great pains to try to disprove Newton's theories. And needless to say, he failed at doing that because Newton was correct to understand that there are different wavelengths that create different colors for the human eye. So there's an underlying principle in the sort of psychological perception of color and the world that is problematic. And it also extends into the Gestalt psychologists of the 20th century. They were largely wrong about a lot of things too. There's really no scientific basis for the Gestalt principles that they talk about, although they are very helpful as tools for designers. So they shouldn't be totally discounted, but their theories, they're not really backed by science. And uh, you know, some, some of the foundation on which they're built is problematic. However, before the Gestalt psychologists came along, there was actually a good deal of experimentation uh, in terms of some of these theories. This is, was a very popular one, also German. And you should recognize that we're looking at both a rabbit facing to the right and a duck facing to the left. Uh, this originally appeared in a German magazine and it was kind of like a joke, but uh, certain uh, philosophers took it very seriously and understood that there's maybe kind of, kind of some big questions about how we understand the world when we look at an image like this that can kind of deceive or fool our eyes. Or another sort of popular uh, optical illusion that plays with Gestalt theory is uh, the young woman uh, who's uh, wearing a, a dark colored hat and has these sort of feathers flowing from behind the hat and one feather sticking up, or the old woman who has her chin tucked into her fur coat. Right? The, both of those images are here. Sometimes it's difficult to see uh, that the, the nose of the old woman is the chin of the young woman. It can be a little uh, deceiving and, and that's the point. Or an even simpler one, we can look at this cube and first of all, understand that it's not really a cube that the, the front and the back are the exact same size and they go against the, the notion of perspective. But then depending on how we look at it, we see that either the front of the cube is towards the top right and the back of it sort of uh, diminishing downward or vice versa, the front can be in the lower left and diminishing backwards. And of course, it's not a cube at all. It's just a number of lines intersecting one another but our mind wants to see it as a cube, despite the fact that it is really not these things, right? So these are the types of optical illusions typically used to describe, to define Gestalt theory. It's not really about that though. And this is a really important point. We can know those sort of key principles and we can think about these simple optical tricks that illustrate them. And they're very nice illustrations. But what the Gestalt theorists were really thinking about was all of art, right? It was the entirety of the way that we create images. And taking seriously the notion that these principles apply across the board, even when they're not obvious. This is a painting by Paul Cezanne, who is one of the best known painters of the 19th century and was an important figure for many artists and also the Gestalt theorists in the early 20th century. I would argue, and I think it's important to note because the Gestalt theorists would also argue that the principles are still here in this painting. We see continuation occurring. We see these figure ground relationships. The shadows create these forms. We, look at, we can look at the ways that proximity can, can make connections between different things and the similarity between forms that fills these, these in. Ultimately, when you look at this painting or another painting by Cezanne, all we have are swatches of color, right? If we were to isolate any little segment of this painting, 
we would just see some sort of, we might see brush strokes, but it's fundamentally just little swatches of, of color. And our eye and our mind do the rest. Our, our eye and our mind create apples and knives and glasses and so forth. None of these things are really here. And it's important to understand that the forms we see are all in line with the notions that the Gestalt theorists presented to us. So even though these are not these sort of optical illusions, this is really what Gestalt theory is about. And uh, we could also look at shapes like this one from Juan Gris, who is an artist that Yori Ke Kepish talks about in the reading. Kepish was a student of the Gestalt theory. He, he emigrated from Europe, he, was, he studied under Laszlo Maholi Naj, so we have another connection there. And he sort of combined the design principles of the Bauhaus with the Gestalt theory that was popular at the time. And this is the premise for language of vision. This is what Kepish is driving towards. This is his, his overarching idea. He takes it a step further and he starts talking about dynamic iconography. That's where we enter into this reading, which happens to be towards the end of his book. Kepish talks about the idea that we, painters like Juan Gris and another uh, painting from Juan Gris, we're moving away from what he calls plastic representation. And by that, when Yuri Kepish says plastic representation, he means naturalistic painting. He means painting as if you're realistically rendering different forms, taking the Renaissance tradition and moving right up until the late 19th and early 20th century when we have people like the Cubists who break away from the conventions of naturalism and create images that, that force us to look in a different kind of way. Kepish believes that these types of paintings move away from a strictly perceptual experience and are headed towards a more social experience with the art. That the viewer must now enter into a sort of understanding, a philosophical relationship to the painter to understand the meaning of an artwork such as this one. He sees this as, he, he, and to pull another quote from the reading, he sees this as an organization of meaning, meaningful visual signs. He sees, he understands that we see relationships, not just optically like the Gestalt theorists believed, but uh, socially and linguistically or semiologically, we start to make connections between the different forms inside of an image. This is another example that he, he gives us. Uh, the idea that we see barbed wire and an eyeball and dirt. Although these could be sort of random objects, nevertheless, we make connections with our mind. We understand that there must be meaning behind all of these things in a way that is connected, that it, in a way that is cohesive. Or another one, uh, Nathan Lerner was one of Kepish's students, and that's why we see these, these images, playing off of similar uh, kind of visuals, this time incorporating threads and, and light sources with the eyeball. Not only do we perceptually integrate forms, but we also understand that there should be some kind of relationship or meaning by virtue of the fact that all these things share the picture plane. They all exist in this, uh, in this similar space. Now, this is how pictures typically work. Kepish recognizes that there's a point following the, oops, wrong image. He recognizes that, that there's a point after the First World War in which something that he, deter, that he terms as the disintegration of meaning organization occurs within pictures. He says that we've done away with fixed perspective. And in many ways, the artists lost all sense of meaning largely because they had experienced the war, right? The world was thrown into chaos and it would make sense that artists uh, created chaotic images. The forms that we understood to hold meaning had disintegrated. They had been 
obliterated by war. And artists responded to that through disintegrated image making. Kurt Schwitters is one of the artists that Kepish references. He also talks about uh, Guillaume Apollinaire, who, who Kepish sees as somebody who works on the reintegration of form, who, who's in the same space, he's living through uh, the world, the First World War, and processing all the, the chaos, the, the ruin, the loss of human life. But Apollinaire, according to Kepish, is finding ways to reintegrate me. He's finding ways to take the sort of fractured lifestyle that people seem to be living in the modern world and finding a new dynamic hole within it, finding a, a new living experience that can be expressed through images. Note that we're not going back to Renaissance style. We're not going back to the plastic representation of fixed linear perspective. Instead, we're taking all of the forms, all of the new possibilities that had emerged in the modern avant-garde art movements and find it, finding a new cohesive whole, putting everything back together to create a new type of dynamic imagery. This is also sort of utopic in some Right, Kepish sees this, this possibility that, that art can once again create new meanings. He states it pretty well when he's, when he's thinking about an artwork like this. I'm going to quote from it sort of extensively because I think there's some important points here. Kepish says, we have seen that the image becomes a living experience on the sensory level only through dyna dynamic participation of the beholder. That's Gestalt theory pure and simple. We saw that plastic experience is based upon the dynamic tendency of the beholder who cannot bear chaos, cannot bear contradiction, and consequently searches for order, for a unified whole which can bind the, which can bind the apparently opposing or contradicting virtual spatial directions of the visual unit, units into a spatial unity. That's what he's talking about, taking these fragments and recreating a visual unity from them. Now, again, this is a sort of very optimistic view towards where modern art can go. And Kepish actually doesn't think that it's going to happen through all art in general. He looks very specifically at advertising and thinks that there's a great possibility in design, in advertising to shape the world and spread new messages. It's not an accident that Herbert Byer is included here because again, Kepish had these uh, sort of connections with uh, some former members of the Bauhaus. And also Byer is one who really embraced this vision. The reading ends, I think again, I'm gonna quote from this. Uh, I think it's important where Kepish says, here lies a great challenge for advertising today. Contemporary man-made environment makes up a very large part of man's visible surroundings. Posters on the streets, picture magazines, picture books, container labels, window displays, and innumerable other existing or potential forms of visual publicity could then serve a double purpose. They could disseminate socially useful messages and they could train the eye and thus the mind with the necessary discipline of seeing beyond the surface of visible things to recognize and enjoy values necessary for an integrated life. So he thinks that advertising messages can create a new lived experience where all the chaos of the modern world somehow comes together in the mind to create a cohesive whole. Whether or not advertising ever did that is up for great debate. Whether or not the principles of Gestalt psychology actually really do any of this, those things is also up for debate. But I think the way that not only Kepish, but also Beatrice Ward are thinking about the way our mind processes words and images gives us some very valuable tools for thinking about how we design and how we interact with the images of our world. So that's the sort of take on this week's reading. I hope you enjoyed. Again, there's, there's not, uh, you do not have to comment on this, but if you have any thoughts, if you have any feedback, if you have any ideas or any questions about these readings, please do so. And I'm looking forward to seeing the content that you share for the other parts of this week's work.
Thanks.